business so we can begin the meeting. Okay, um, we are minus a supervisor, but we're working on it. So if we do have a quorum, let's begin the meeting. Um, please write a oh, roll call, please. Supervisor Christie. Here. Supervisor Grijalva. Here. Supervisor Hines. Supervisor Scott. Here. Chair Bronson. Here. Let the record show Supervisor Hines is not present. All other members are present. All right. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance to be offered by Supervisor Christie with the land acknowledgement statement to follow, uh, which will be read by April Ignacio. Please join me for the pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. reading the land acknowledgement on behalf of Pima County residents we honor the tribal nations who have served as caretakers of the land from time memorial and respect fully acknowledge the ancestral homelands of the Thana Otham nation and the multi-millennial presence of the Pasco Yaqui tribe within Pima County Consistent with Pima County's commitment to diversity and inclusion, we strive toward building equal partner relationships with Arizona's tribal nations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit? Of, why don't you give us a little bit of background about you <laughs> and how you got here today? And thank you so much for reading this statement. Um, good morning. Um, Chairwoman, uh, my name is April Ignacio. Like I said, um, I'm Thano Otham. I am a co-founding member of Indivisible Thano, which is a grassroots community-based organization that focuses on voter registration, education, civic engagement for members of the Thano Otham Nation. I am a mother to six. Oh, wow. I'm a student at the University of Arizona. I also... Um, I'm the uh, traditional women's games coordinator for the tribe. And I'm, every time I come to this building, I'm happy to see my great grandfather was the first tribal chairman of the Thana Atham Nation in your, um, in your lobby here. That's fascinating. I was invited uh, by uh, a supervisor, supervisor uh, Aralita Grajalva. Well, it sounds like you're a busy woman and you're doing good things. So again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, um, do we have any changes to the, no changes to the agenda? To the agenda. So I'm gonna take a, moment, a, a personal privilege before we uh, do the proclamation and um, just taking a moment of personal privilege, wanting to congratulate one of a native Tucson and Don Guerrero of Barrio Bread. Earlier this month, he won the James Beard Award for Outstanding Baker. If you're unfamiliar, the yay. Beard Awards, yay! The Beard Awards are the Oscars of the food service industry. His passion, his skill as a baker, and his use of locally grown heritage grains continues to focus international attention on our community. This is a very prestigious award and well deserved. And if you haven't tried the bread yet, stop by at his store at the, Broad at the Broadmoor at Broadway and Country Club and get her gear early because they sell out fast. So again, congratulations. And then I think another congratulations is in order, and that's to one of my favorite former Wildcats, Steve Kerr, 
and the Golden State Warriors, who just won the NBA title for the fourth time. And Steve himself um, has five rings from when time he was a player. So congratulations, Golden State, and congratulations, Steve Kerr, one of our favorite Wildcats. Yay. Thank you. Chair Bronson? Yes. I would like to take a point of personal privilege. Um, our office coordinated with the YWCA of Southern Arizona, the Diaper Bank, um, different board offices, including our council members, Kasachik and uh, Vice Chair Lane Santa Cruz. And we collected for during period poverty awareness 13,942 wow. products. I know. So I'm very impressed. It was our second year, and we were just trying to match last year, so we almost doubled. So I want to thank everyone who donated and participated. Well, congratulations to all who got that done. Very impressive. Madam Chair. Supervisor Christie. Madam Chair, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege too and to give uh, a great deal of acknowledgement, recognition, and appreciation to the Sheriff's Auxiliary uh, Volunteers. This is the fifth year they've uh, collaborated with our office at the base of Mount Lemmon, uh, handing out uh, fire-wise and fire safety information to the visitors up on the mountain and, and into the villages. Uh, they're out there from seven in the morning till all hours during the heat of the week and the weekend and they're they're uh, passing any uh, passing out anywhere from 12 to 1800 flyers a day and it's boring tough hard work but they've done it now for five years and it takes a, a great deal of effort and commitment for them to do that and that should we should all be grateful uh, particularly when with this program we've had very good success at uh, educating the public about fire dangers on the mountain so uh, knock on wood, uh, we're still in the middle of a very difficult fire season, but we have the uh, sh Sheriff's Auxiliary uh, volunteers to thank for their work in trying to educate the public about making sure that there are no uh, uh, issues up on the mountain with fires. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and speaking of that, I'm hoping, speaking of fires, um, when we have the county administrator update, perhaps we can get um, some indication of where we are and the fire that's burning near Kitt Peak. And with that, um, and there are no changes to the agenda, let's move on to item one on the addendum agenda, which is a presentation proclamation uh, to Larry Starks, President of Juneteenth Festival Board, declaring the week of June 19th through the 25th to be Juneteenth Celebration Week. I'll move the item. I'll second. second. Motion and a second. And if there are no objections, motion carries. And if I could get the two of you up here, uh, I'll make the, I'll read the proclamation. All right. Whereas President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation freeing enslaved people in 1862, but the Civil War continued and Texas was far beyond the significant battlegrounds, and whereas many slaveholders during the Civil War fled from war-torn areas to Texas, taking enslaved people with them, and whereas there were thousands of enslaved people in Texas by the time the Confederate General Robert E. Lee surrendered on April 9, 1865, yet they did not learn of the, their emancipation until June 19th. 
Whereas the following year, in 1866, former enslaved people in Texas began celebrating Juneteenth as a holiday, and whereas all 50 states, including Arizona, recognized Juneteenth as a day of celebration, and whereas the state of Texas was the first in the nation to make Juneteenth a paid state holiday, and 13 other states have since done, has since done the same. And whereas the United States Congress and President Joe Biden created June 19th, Juneteenth National Independence Day federal holiday in June 2021 to be celebrated every June 19th, and whereas the Pima County community has come together to celebrate Juneteenth for 52 years, and whereas the Juneteenth Tucson Festival just completed a weekend of celebration and educational events. Therefore, be it resolved that the Pima County Board of Supervisors hereby proclaims the week of June 19th through June 25th, 2022 to be Juneteenth Celebration Week and encourages all county residents to reflect on the significance of the new Juneteenth holiday and the abolish, aboli, abolishment of slavery in our great nation and to celebrate the extraordinary contributions and achievements of African Americans in Pima County and the nation passed and adopted this 21st day of June 2022. And would either of you like to say a few words? So how was Kennedy Park this weekend? Um, it was amazing. It was a blessing. Um, if I could just say to everyone, I mean, she was there. She knows. But uh, <laughs> I mean, it was a it was a, a large undertaking. It was the first time that this festival was going back to a major park in probably over ten years. It was the first major festival that was going to be held at the Kenny Park Fiesta area in over about eight years. So it was a large, large undertaking for us. But I, but my committee, my board members, uh, we worked hard. Um, the weather, God bless held up for us we thought we were gonna get rained on but the weather went around us you know we prayed for good weather and it was a beautiful day we had uh, throughout the day I would say probably over 1,500 to 2,000 people that attended our festival on that day we had bands we had food um, we gave away toys to every kid that came to the park thanks to Amazon uh, black employee network we had a car show with over 40 different cars the festival was different than what you may have seen in different years because what we try to do now with Juneteenth is make sure Sure, people understand that this is inclusive. This is a community event. It's a Tucson event. It's a Southern Arizona event. So that anybody and everybody needs to come and celebrate and understand that. And before I go, I just want to say thank you to a few people. I feel like I got an award, but uh, <laughs> but just so people understand that you know this is not a small undertaking. And without money, of course, you can't do these things. So. We had some people stepped up to uh, help us. Arizona One, uh, One Arizona stepped up. Uh, TEP, Emerge Center for Domestic Violence, um, the African American Museum, and especially uh, the University of Arizona uh, sponsored us at the highest level over $10,000 to help us. So without that and their dedication to help us, we wouldn't have this festival. So, <clears throat> and what we're also doing with this festival is moving it forward so that we're engaging in the community. We also had a call to action for men of color so that we can have and talk about intergenerational masculinity to talk about how uh, fatherless, fatherlessness and the community affects us. So we're not just one day a year event. You know, it's a whole event. We donated over, as a part of our Starks Family Foundation, we donated over 350 wigs to the Arizona Oncology on behalf of the Starks Family and the uh, Juneteenth Festival because a lot of people don't understand that wigs are expensive for people with cancer. A lot of them can't afford them. But here at TMC, Arizona Oncology gives out free wigs and we're able to donate over 350 wigs to them on behalf of Juneteenth so again it's it's a community thing it's we're moving forward if anybody wants to be a part of us please let us know it was a blessing our our uh, gospel jubilee on Sunday at the Dunbar um, we were expecting about a hundred people we had over 350 people at the Dunbar so it was a it was a beautiful weekend um, so thank you Tucson for coming out and helping us celebrate got me on the food. I ate too much. I'm sorry, but, but Ian, the, the thing, we had an eclectic mix of food. We had fry bread, tacos, uh, Maui Wowie, 
ribs, um, catfish. <laughs> I mean, so Tucson tamale. We had a lot of different foods there. So again, it's about being inclusive of everyone, so that you know everybody feels a part of what we're doing. Thank you, thank and you. thank you all for what you do for the community. Congratulations on a successful event. Oh, we want to. Show that. Thank you. All right, and now we're going to move on to pause for pause. We were supposed to have Mama, which was a dog, but that doesn't look like a dog. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is Lisa Royal, and I am privileged to be the Deputy Director of PAC. And no, this isn't little mama, this is Dinah. And believe it or not, it is still kitten season. Oh my Dinah is eight weeks old. She is available for adoption. She is absolutely adorable. She got her name because after a motorcycle because she's got a motor. On the way over <laughs> here today, she was rolling her R's better than I can. And for a minute, I thought I had a beagle in the car because she was doing a little howling at the same time. But she is, she is so sweet. Um, and we'd love for her to get adopted as well as all of our other animals that are at the shelter. See, I'm, I'm sure Supervisor Grijalva is quite interested. I love cats. I she used helped to have her. them, but... My, my two of my children are very allergic, unfortunately. Aww. I know. Well, I am too. But, you know, it's like other duties as assigned, right? I know. They're so <laughs> cute. Uh, she's also like a friend of Jan Lusher's back there, too. So, <laughs> Anyway, we are still over capacity at the shelter. Um, we are uh, preparing for Fourth of July, which uh, is always difficult for animals. It's it's fun for kids and, and adults, but it's really scary for our four-legged four friends. We're going to be doing a big push uh, next week to try to clear the shelter so that we can make room for the strays that we expect to come in one to three days after 4th of July. Believe it or not, we really don't. Uh, many people don't turn in animals uh, on the 4th of July holiday because they're home celebrating, but afterwards, the next three days is when we see the huge influx. Um, so we are making preparations now. We can't, we can't tell people enough how important it is to microchip and put a collar and identification on your animal. Um, never say never. And for the limited time I've been at the shelter, I've seen people that have come to look for strays that have said, my dog never gets out. Um, well, they do. Uh, so please just be prepared and, and prepare in advance. If, even if you have a magic marker, a Sharpie, write a phone number on the collar. Just do something for identification because what we really want to do is if your dog shows up at PAC, we want to get it back to you. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. And just as a reminder, what, because it is the fourth, instead of buying fireworks, donate to PAC or to a, another shelter. Donate some food for pets. There you go. Thank all you right. so much. Thank you. Remember, um, no fees right now. Uh, every, all the adoptions are free, just a $20 license. All right, Dino, let's go. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, now we move on to call to the public. Individuals wishing to participate telephonically, once again, are reminded to call to contact the clerk of the board, the, the office at 724-8449 to register their request and obtain remote access information by the deadline of Monday um, before pre, uh, 5 p.m. prior to a board meeting. Each speaker is limited to three minutes and the number of speakers may be limited 
due to high volume of requests, please be aware that you may not be called on to speak if we have a high volume. E-comments can be submitted to the to cob underscore mail at pima.gov. With that, we'll begin call to the public. Our first speaker is Robert. Where are you? I know I saw you. Robert. 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 Oh, there you are. Okay. Royce, yep. I don't jump when I hear Robert because sometimes there's numerous ones around. Um, I'm Robert Royce. Uh, parties without, political parties without principles are dangerous things, but political parties that have abandoned their principles are even more dangerous. So as I review the principles that our country was founded on this summer, I would urge you all to understand that they are the very same principles that both parties were founded on. Our original Jeffersonian party abandoned them on the day in 1828 when the general dislodged the statesman as presidential nominee. And the other party, which took up the Whig uh, mantle when the original Jeffersonian party abandoned it, um, abandoned it on its own at the very moment when Abraham Lincoln was killed. So there's nothing revolutionary in anything I'm gonna say this summer. It's been, principles have been laying in the dirt for over 200 years now. Um, <clears throat> let's see, where was I going with this? Yes, parties without principles are dangerous things. So um, with all these Blessings, what more is necessary for us to be a happy and a prosperous people? But one thing more, fellow citizens, a wise and frugal government which shall restrain men from injuring one another, which shall leave them otherwise free, otherwise free to conduct their own personal and business affairs, shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread which it has earned. Well, let's not get into my definition of, of, of injury, because it's pretty broad. But let's get down to this other way. We are, not an other, we are not a free people. We're not a free people. The freedom to you means you have a right to go trampling on the rights of other human beings, polluting our air and water, and in any way precluding people having a safe, prosperous, and happy life. We are an otherwise free people because only after we have discharged our responsibilities to respect the rights of other human beings do we find our highest measure as a free country and a free people. Thank you. Thank you. Rayana Eldon, Eldan. Before you start my time, may I have um, permission, please, to have somebody hand you some documents that I will reference? Do what? I have. I just give the packets to clerk of the board. Okay. Chair Bronson, Supervisors, my name is Rayanna Eldon. Thank you for the time to speak. I'm speaking to you about elections. Um, I have evidence that there were no legal votes in 2020, and there are slated to be no legal votes for 2022. And um, a group uh, that I'm a part of has taken this information to every branch of government at the state level and put in four court cases into the Arizona Supreme Court and have been turned away by everybody regarding this. Nevertheless, it is true, it is fact, and um, I challenge you to challenge me on any detail of it. Arizona ARS 16-442B, machines or devices used at any election for federal, state, or county offices may only be certified for use in this state and may only be used in this state if 
they comply with the Help America Vote Act of 2002, and if those machines or devices have been tested and approved by a laboratory that is accredited pursuant to the Help America Vote Act of 2002. Uh, supervis supervisors, I would just let you know that there were no accredited labs in 2020. There still are no accredited labs. And again, a group of us have researched this for uh, over a year, and May last year was our first court case that we put into the Arizona Supreme Court. So these are facts. This is black letter law. It also then goes back to the Arizona Constitution, uh, Article 7, Section 7, <coughs> which is that only legal votes may be counted. So if there were no machines certified pursuant to law, then there was not one legal vote for 2020. And I dare say, with all due respect, because you didn't know this, but none of you are in office lawfully. Uh, I've told this to Republicans, to Democrats, this is not a partisan issue. We've been ignored by Republicans. I'm just as furious at all, all politicians who find out this information and who do nothing. So I'm concerned for Pima County. I'm concerned for the upcoming elections because the Election Assistance Commission still is not in compliance. And you may not be able to fix that. That's a federal entity. I understand the state and federal government interplay there. However, it is your responsibility now that you know about it. And there's details in the packets that I've given you, including an affidavit by a whistleblower uh, named Terpsihuri Maras, who, Maris, who has uh, evidence that you'll want to look at. It's actually quite fascinating, despite, n you know, no matter your party, so that you know, um, and I would encourage you, and indeed I would uh, say that it's your duty to have a look at that affidavit and carefully read it through. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. For the record, uh, Supervisor Hines has joined us. Deborah Nugent. Uh, hello, thank you for allowing me to speak. And I've uh, got a couple things that I just want to bring to the board's attention. And I have a couple questions on your meeting agenda, especially under the uh, community and economic development. The Humane Borders in Incorporated Amendment Number Four to provide for water distribution services in remote areas, and that's going to run about thirty thousand and it's extended for another year. Could you explain to me exactly what that means? One we of cannot you? respond and call to the public. Okay. Um, then what my concern is, is I know what it's used for, and I'm going to state it right out. You are enticing, you mean well, but you're not looking at the unintended consequences. You're trying to entice people to come up thinking they're going to get water on the way. Okay, I don't know if a lot of you are aware of, but in the last 17 months, uh, we're facing extreme food shortages. So you're inviting and enticing people to come up. We're not going to be able to half feed all of us. In the last 17 months, we've had 10,000 cattle di died, uh, were killed. We've had 100 disasters in our food industries. Most have been caused by some small plane crashing into them. Mm -hmm. We've had 2 million turkeys killed. 40 million chickens have been killed. Uh, and the current administration is saying, well, we're going to shut down all the oil and gas because of the pollution. Well, what they don't tell you is there is no alternative plan. We are not ready for whatever this administration and people have in their head. I know that our uh, land mine, our uh, landfills have been filled with all the wind uh, turbines that have come off. Uh, with no alternative plan, there's estimates of over 100 million of us starving to death. So I'd like to know how this board can sit and vote to entice people to come up where we're going to be lucky to feed all of us and what exactly is going to happen to these people and us. So I think some of you need to consider some of your considerations. You may mean well, but the road to hell is paid with good intentions. And at the moment, as a citizen, I'm looking at my government that's trying to kill me and my fellow citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Anastasia Sazakis. Sazakis.
Good morning. I come to you here today not only as a mother and a wife and a community member, but I also come to you here as a governing board candidate for Vail. Over the last two years, I've seen extremely disturbing things happening in our school systems and the actual abuse of our children by our governments, federal, local, and state. There is no denial of that. Absolutely none of you can deny that. The evidence speaks, speaks facts. And what I keep seeing and what I keep hearing about and what I keep reading about, this is actual events that are taking place at this moment. And what I have been speaking to at my own board meetings is the usurpation of parental rights here in the state of Arizona and in our county. The parents of Arizona have a Bill of Rights, ARS 601-602. Feel free to read them and read up on them if you have not done so. I certainly have over the last few years. And I am extremely disturbed that I'm seeing things like what's going to be happening in Sunnyside. I know Sunnyside's not in my backyard, but I can tell you things like this are leaking into my district because of Pima County. And especially with what Pima County Arizona Department of Health did and this board has done to our children. And now you're going to try to put immunizations into the school system. And I read that 50 some odd page document last night because someone sent it to me. And I was appalled. You are usurping parental rights. You're doing this stuff behind the backs of the parents and it is not going to be accepted by anybody. I am sick and tired of the Department of Health usurping our rights also during quarantine. And in case you guys didn't know, multiple times people have spoken to the fact that quarantine cannot happen unless there is a court order to do so. Within a 10-day window of a supposed contact. Our kids have been tortured and terrorized enough by this county, this state, and all the other governmental entities who chose to take advantage of that. And shame on this governor, shame on all of you, and shame on the Arizona Department of Health in this county for taking advantage of our children and the parents' rights. No longer. Every parent should say no. And if they cannot get the answer no out of the school district and pull these kinds of things and stop telling kids it's okay to hide things from their parents, then you are at fault. You need to walk and you need to be fired. Laura, hang up. Laura? I am here to say no, no to increases to property taxes, no more lodging. We voted not to be a sanctuary city, yet here you are not abiding by it or upholding it. If you want to pay for it, you do it on your dime. How many criminals have, have you harbored? How about the man who was training people in Tucson a few years ago to make car bombs? Or the terrorists who owned a car wash up in Phoenix, both of which came across our, our border illegally? No more to health department increases of emergency powers. No to the use of CDC shield, green zone, HR 6666 to surveillance us. No to contact tracers. PCR tests are not reliable, and I want to thank Rex Scott for recognizing that. Masks do not work, and even say so on the pamphlets they contain. They do not protect against viruses. COVID-19 vaccination, vaccination pamphlets are blank, and if they were safe, then why is the FDA slideshow and the Pfizer presentation three months prior to FDA approval known to, to have to know, to, stated that they that what the causes of the harm would be? I have a Moderna patent dated. 12-12 of 2019, prior to the outbreak of COVID-19, signed by Ralph Barrick. 80 Marines at Fort Bragg last summer were found dead in their bunks after being vaccinated, 160,000 per death with remdesivir causing organ failure within 10 days. No nutrients are being given to patients during that time, blowing out their lungs by operating the ventilators above half capacity, which you're not supposed to do. Matt Hines, 
Dr. Matt Haynes, you are a disgrace to your profession. You are breaking your oath as a doctor. You should be brought in front of the medical review board and your license revoked. You refuse to treat patients who are not vaccinated and call those who are not vaccinated for something that has a 99.9% .9 survival rate murderers. You are the murderer when you refuse to treat a patient and they die because of it. I would like to submit to you documentation, including the proof that the COVID vac vaccinations are premeditated murder. Right here. Along with an indictment, a proposed indictment for Fauci, Moderna, Pfizer, etc. And would you like to be impl implicated in as well? You have gotten away with treason and crimes against humanity for now, but keep con contributing to the harm you to your constituents and the laws that you're breaking. You will eventually face criminal charges. Thank you. Your time is expired. Thank you. Stephanie and I would like Kirk. to hand this in. Stephanie Kirk. I want to start off by discussing a medical study, um, a peer-reviewed medical study. You can look it up. It's called COVID-19 Vaccination BNT 162B2 temporar Temporarily Impairs Semen Concentration and Total, total Motility Count Among Semen Donors. That was once said to be fake. I was kicked off Facebook because I said it. Currently, the inflation in 2022 midterm is 8.6 and has risen at the fastest pace in over 40 years since Jimmy, Jimmy Carter in 1980. Inflation has hit the working class and poverty stricken the hardest. I vote no regarding the increase in property taxes in an already suffering economy as it will only add to our growing homelessness in the area. Because our border is wide open and will continue to worsen once Title 42 is removed, I hold this board responsible for increasing crime rates, suicides, homelessness, and necessary taxes. In May 2022, there were over 239,416 migrants that crossed our southwest border illegally, which is unfair to those that do it legally. At the border, it is not a secret that young girls and women are being raped. I do not support this payout for the lodging or any other tax money funding the situation, including the funding for the morning after pill or any other unnecessary medical procedures because our administration and board of supervisors failed us at the border. The board encourages drug cartels to drop off caravans of illegal immigrants in the night by using $3.5 million in tax money for lodging. It is apparent that we can't even deal with our own homeless population brought on harder by the board, mandating experimental injections that don't stop or prevent transmission for disease with a 99.997% survival rate. Matt, have we forgot our math? Per voter registration, I would like to thank Steve Christie for finding issues in a soon-to-be disastrous August election. The new elect electronic deep state owned systems despite the community's voice to keep paper ballots. For many, voter integrity has declined due to the suspicious activity in many states regarding the last presidential election. The removal of the present precinct voting and paper ballots for electronic voting will only add to the community's distrust. Like schools who accept the ARP S3 funds to force tyrannical mandates, this board continues to receive federal money in exchange to increase the county COVID-19 surveillance and response to the systems which favor the Model State Health Powers Act and the CDC's shielding plan. Their surveillance and oversight is unwanted by the American people and seen as a waste of taxpayer funds and as abuses our constitutional freedoms by not providing proper checks and balances. Approving the 2022-23 Pima County Health Service budget will only prolong this pandemic, which will blame, will build a name that each of you will have to live with for the rest of your life. The regulatory agencies like the FDA, Board of Supervisors, CDC, NIH, WHO, NIAID, NIAID have become drug lords for big pharma government and the board and the health department have been carrying out tyrannical ideology when the boards cannot make law, but they are making a pocket load of cash by serving on vaccine boards and the regulatory boards. Not everybody can have a daddy that serves on the Congress. Drew Heaton. 
True Heaton, there we are. Um, Madam Chairwoman Bronson, Board of Supervisors, Administrator Lesher. For the record, my name is Drew Heaton and I apologize in advance for making my statement and leaving immediately. Out of respect for you, I often stay as long as I can even though it's a sacrifice to my family and business. Today I have to care for a family member. What I have shared with you through the Clerk of the Board is information that I shared with Richard Elias when we sat together in his office. I have been watching the vaccine issue for the last 30 years. I have been a vocal advocate for informed con consent for the last eight. So that was long before the current health situation. He sympathized with my concerns and he cautioned that I would need to understand the economic relationships that influence vaccine policy or any policy. This morning on the radio, the news announced that Monsanto, uh, acquired by Bayer, is now embroiled in massive health lawsuits, which is one of the things that when I became, stepped out as that angry activist, <laughs> um, uh, we, were, we were right. Like I said last time we met together here before this, we were right. We are right on this issue. And I'm praying that you will change your heart and mind. Um, I, this, these are a few quotes from Robert F. Kennedy, who I think people know is a well-known Democrat. The four companies that make all 72 of the vaccines that are currently mandated for our children, every one of them is con a convicted felon. Over the last 10 years, those four companies collectively have paid $35 billion in penalties, fines, and damages for their criminal behaviors and for all their other pharmaceutical products. And somehow the Democrats have convinced themselves that yes, they lie about everything else, but they have found Jesus when it comes to vaccines and that they're not going to lie about that. This movement that calls you anti-vax is the most misogynist movement that I have ever seen in my lifetime. It is a movement that is anti-mother and is anti-woman. The names that I hear coming out of the people's mouths about hysterics and refrigerator moms and all of this in our major newspapers like the New York Times is extraordinary. And I want to say something about these women before I stand down. I was raised around extraordinary women. But I've never met women like these ones that I've met in this movement. They are articulate, they're eloquent, they're pharmacists, they're doctors, they're lawyers, they have read the silence, science, they know what the science says, and they can destroy any of these politicians if they were given the ability to debate. Dr. Cullen, Dr. Garcia, Dr. Hines, I respectively challenge you to a debate. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Speaker is Peter Narquist. Thank you. All right, good morning, uh, members of the board, uh, Administrator Lesher and Dr. Garcia. My name is Peter Norquist. I have the pleasure of visiting Super Sky, uh, Supervisor Scott's booth at the Rito Farmer's Market on Father's Day. Uh, and having seen the materials on hand, it's clear that he and his staff take an interest in the welfare of the children of Pima County. With this as background, I found particularly disturbing this announcement of June 18th, the day prior to Father's Day. The CDC has approved COVID-19 vaccines for children under five years old. The Pima County Health Department previously placed its order through the state and expects to have vaccines available at our clinics early this week, possibly Tuesday, which would be today. This intersects with one particular budget line item upon which you'll be voting today for the Department of Health. Unit code 3512, increasing COVID vac vaccination capacity, recommended amount $9,500,000. In light of the fact that you will be voting to fund a nearly $10 million vaccination budget, which will now include children under five years old, I ask you to consider the following. The European database of suspected drug reaction reports is Eudra Vigilance, verified by the European Medicines Agency, and of January 29th, 2022, there have been reported 38,983 fatalities and 3,530,362 injuries following injections of the four experimental COVID-19 shots. There were a variety of systems affected, the most widely reported being gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, and nervous system. 
From the total entries recorded, almost half of them, 1,672,872 were serious injuries, which means they correspond to a medical occurrence that results in death, are life-threatening, require inpatient hospitalization, result in another medical, uh, medically important condition, or result in persistent or significant disability or incapacity. Note that multiple databases, such as the U.S. VAERS database and the U.K. Yellow Card system, have yielded the same results. Another source of vaccine entry reporting is the DOD's own internal military database, the DMED system. In the same last week of January 2022, the DMED showed post-vaccination miscarriages and cancers up 300% over a five-year average. In addition to this, the following were found, an increase of 269% in heart attacks, 175% in acute pericarditis, 285% in acute myocarditis, 467 in pulmonary embolisms, 1,175% increase in blood clotting, 1,529% increase in chest pain issues, and 905% increase in difficulty breathing. There were also startling increases in other illnesses, including neurological issues. Given the statistics above and the fact that children in particular have experienced virtually no severe COVID-related outcomes, I implore you to reconsider any plans you may have to consider to offer these experimental injections and to revise your budget line thank, accordingly. Thank you. Your time has expired. To do so otherwise is to risk doing great and unnecessary harm to the children of Pima County, something for which I'm sure you don't want to be remembered. Thank you for your time. All right, that concludes call to the public. Um, we're now going to move on to our budget adopt final budget adoption meeting. As we said at our last board meeting, we are going to actually continue this item until our July 5th meeting. So item 6 through 14, I am going to open the public hearing and move for continuance. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second. We need a roll call vote on this. Roll call vote. Supervisor Christie. Yes. Supervisor Grijalva. Yes. Supervisor Hines. Yes. Supervisor Scott. Yes. Chair Bronson. Yes. By your unanimous vote, this budget hearing adoption meeting will be continued till July 5th. We now move on to the executive session. There are three executive session items on the addendum agenda items two, three, and four. I'll move to, uh, I'd entertain a motion to move into exec. I'll go ahead and move the item. Is there a second? Second. Motion and a second to move into exec. If there are no objections, we'll convene in exec and reconvene in regular session at the sound of the gavel.
see now it's All right, well, we're back in a, uh, from exec and regular session. Madam Chair. S uh, Supervisor. Uh, I would like to make a motion that uh, we approve on the regular agenda. On item two, on, on the regular agenda? Uh-huh. What on? We're, we just finished executive session. No, we're on the addendum agenda. That's where the execs were. Oh, I beg your pardon, sorry. We're on item two in the exec, and that's legal advisory regarding the Centurion Notice of Claim. What's the pleasure of the board? Uh, uh, Chair Bronson, I'd like to go ahead and move as directed um, in executive session or as discussed in executive session. Uh, I'll second. If there's no discussion and there are no objections, motion carried. Moving on to item three, um, what's the pleasure of the board on this item? Supervisor... Christy, I think that's the one you were going. I would uh, I would mo make the motion that we uh, follow the direction as, as discussed in executive session. I'll second. Se there's motion and a second by Supervisor Grijalva. Um If there are no objections, we'll proceed as recommended in exec session. Um, moving on to item four, uh, Nolan Brown. What's the pleasure of the board? Chair Bronson. Supervisor Grahal. Go ahead and, and move the move as discussed in executive session. I'll second. If there's no discussion or objections, motion carries. We now move back to our regular agenda. Madam Chair. Supervisor Christie. I would like to make a motion that uh, we approve items 15 through 22. This is Flood Control District Board, um, 15 through 22. If I will second, if nobody wants to divide the question. Um, no, that's fine, Chair Bronson. Do you uh, have to list, though, that it's also library district and stadium? Because you have flood control, then if through 22 would be uh, stadium. Stay, yeah, okay. Uh, yes, we're sitting as flood control district board, library district board, and stadium district board. If there are no objections to items 15 through 20 sec 22. 22 um, I'll second. I think I did. Did you? Yeah. Okay. But go All ahead, right. just for the record. Okay. Supervisor Grijalva showed that she seconded it. And um, if there's no discussion or Madam objection. Madam Chair. Supervisor. I just had a question for Dr. Garcia with regard to um, item 21, uh, which is uh, dealing with uh, Library Services and Technology Act to provide for trauma-informed services. Uh, trauma-informed services project. Is there a focus there on uh, young people, or are, are these trauma-informed services for the entire population? I wasn't clear on that when I was looking at the item. Chair Brown, the Supervisor um, Scott. Um, indeed, the general focus is on providing trauma-informed uh, information for our community at large. Um, there are components that have to do with uh, young people and adolescents. Okay, if there are no further questions or objections, motion carried. Now I'm going to move to, before we go to consent, I want to move because we have um, actually several members from the office of the attorney general uh, with us today and res being respectful of their time i want to move to both items 27 and 31 31 has to be approved before item 27 which is the presentation the powerpoint presentation by the attorney general's office so i will move item 31 
reconsideration. Oh, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I got it backwards. We have to approve 27 prior to 31. So um, I'm going to, uh, before we approve the item, item 27, if we get the PowerPoint presentation by Stephanie Gerber and John Falk of the Office of the Attorney General. I think it's coming up. Yep. This says Attorney General. We're actually with the Arizona Auditor General. Well, yeah, but uh, yeah, the, my notes said Attorney General, but yes, I don't know why the Attorney General, <laughs> our mistake. Thank you for the correction. All right. All right. Our slides are showing. Good morning, Madam Chair Bronson and board members. To introduce myself, I'm Stephanie Gerber, and I'm the office's financial audit director. I oversee all of the financial related audits that our office conducts. With me today is John Falk, the audit manager over your audits. As all of you know, last year's new law revised ARS 15 1473 that requires you, the board, to have our office present our annual audit results. And we thank you for inviting us to do so today. To give you a little information about the Arizona Auditor General, our audit work focuses on the accuracy of the county's financial statements and compliance with certain laws and regulations. Also, we work to help yours and other counties to increase accountability and understand important laws, to help you as governance make important decisions to ensure the county is spending and accounting for its public monies, including federal program monies appropriately. We strive to provide recommended improvements to help governments fulfill their responsibilities efficiently and effectively. Next slide, please. Before I begin going over the audit reports, I'd also like to take this opportunity to very briefly explain what we follow when we conduct our audits. State and federal laws require Arizona counties to receive annual financial and compliance audits, including audits of federal programs. We conduct our audits in accordance with three main standards and regulations as shown on this slide. First are the U.S. Generally Accepted Auditing Standards, which are issued by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. These are the same standards that CPA firms follow when conducting many of their audits of private business and other governmental entities. Second, for audits of most governmental entities, auditors must also follow government auditing standard standards issued by the Comptroller General of the United States. The Madam stand Chair. Supervisor. Um, just to, I apologize for interrupting, but uh, in that second bullet it says add other specific requirements for governmental entities. Could you speak to some of the more significant specific requirements that are added for governmental entities? All right, so you're referring to the second bullet, the U.S. Yeah, government? I was just wondering what other specific requirements. It's a, your last phrase is, but add other specific requirements for government entities. He wants a clarification on that. So it, under Yellow Book auditing standards, it requires us to issue certain reports, like the report on internal controls and compliance. Right. So that would be the most significant addition? Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So I'm not sure where, where I left off. I'm gonna, if I'm repeating, I apologize, but I don't want to. No, I think we're point. on the U.S. Single Audit <laughs> Act, Uniform Guidance Regulations. Okay, so the third bullet, we're required to audit the county's federal programs following federal requirements based on the Federal Single Audit Act and is stipulated by federal uniform guidance. All of these standards require that we maintain our independence, integrity, and objectivity. Next slide, please. We conduct our audits annually. As we have done and will continue to do in future years, we send you emails when your annual reports are completed. Today we will be discussing our audit work on the county's annual comprehensive financial report and the associated report on internal control and on compliance and single audit report. 
We sent each of you links to these reports in three separate emails dated December 16th, 2021, January 26th, 2022, and April 18th, 2022. The most recent email included a link to our report highlights that summarize these reports. Those reports along with the prior reports can be found on our website at azauditor.gov. To give a little more detail about these reports, the county's financial report presents the county's annual financial statements and our opinion on them. As in prior years, we reported an unmodified or clean opinion, which means the county's financial statements are reliable. Second, the report on internal control and on compliance includes our required financial statement, internal control and compliance reports. This report is where you will see any findings we found during our financial audit, along with the county's responses to them. Finally, the single audit report includes our opinion on the county's compliance with federal program requirements over each federal program that we are required to audit. Our report on internal control over compliance with federal programs and the county's schedule of federal expenditures and our opinion on it. The single audit report is where you will see any findings we found during our federal compliance audit, along with the county's responses to them. We reported no financial or federal findings for the year ended June 30th, 2021. However, the county did correct a prior year finding over IT controls, and John will provide you more details about the corrected findings soon. For Pima County, these reports that I previously mentioned are separate or presented in three separate documents. Next slide, please. Because we know those reports are long and complex, as I mentioned earlier, we also prepare audit report highlights. A two-page summary that includes the county's largest primary revenue sources and how the county used those monies, as well as brief information about our key findings and recommendations. Again, those highlights can be found on our website. Next slide, please. Also, our audit standards require us to communicate certain information to governance, including each of you, the board members, and Ms. Jan Lesher, County Administrator. As I mentioned earlier, we email you when we issue reports, including our report highlights. And I hope you have noted that when we send emails, we, we send you emails when we begin our audits and when we complete them. We provide information in our audit completion email to make sure you know to make sure you know our audits were completed and whether we encountered any difficulties. As always, we did not have any difficulties with Pima County's audits. Finally, I'll just give a brief mention that our office provides resources on our website that you can see listed here. If anyone needs guidance related to the county's financial related topics, please never hesitate to reach out to John or me. So with that, I'm gonna turn over the time to John Falk and he will briefly explain the prior year finding that was corrected by the county. And I would again like to express my and our office's appreciation for inviting us to present to the board. And I'd be happy to answer any questions now or after John's presentation. Thank you. And um, both of you, can you make sure you share with the clerk of the board your contact information so she can share it with all the board members? That yes. would be great. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you for letting us uh, present to you today. As Stephanie mentioned, we reported no findings in our audit reports for the year ended June 30, 2021. And is that unusual? Um, it is the first year there has not been findings in several years. Yes. So, thank you. Um, however, we did report on the status of a previously reported audit finding. Um, this information can be, is reported in the summary schedule of prior audit findings, which you can find at the back of the single audit report. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the, the prior year finding. In fiscal year 2020, during that audit, we reported one finding recommending that additional controls be implemented to improve restricting access to the county's IT systems and data. It is important to note that restricting access to the county's IT systems helped reduce the risk of unauthorized or inappropriate access and or the loss of confidentiality or integrity of IT systems and data. We did note during the fiscal year 2021 audit, because we always follow up on prior year reported findings, we noted that the county fully corrected that finding 
by implementing procedures to periodically review account access and ensure that the access that is granted is appropriate and necessary. I also wanted to mention that over the last several audit periods, we have reported various findings related to IT controls. The county has successfully implemented our recommendations from those audits to mitigate those findings as well. Um, at this time, I can answer any questions you had specific to the audit report or the prior finding. Um, no, I'm actually familiar with all of this since that's my background. And I'm so glad I don't have to do GAP or GAS anymore. <laughs> but thank you. Very informative. Any questions from board members? Madam Chair. Supervisor. Uh, with regard to the uh, county meeting uh, the requirements in last year's finding, what long-term recommendations do you have either to that particular department uh, or to uh, the county administrator so that that doesn't become a concern again? As far as the, the finding that was reported in the prior year? Yes, sir. The, the areas that we rep, uh, look at, and, and as far as internal controls at the county, we look at those every single year. So um, we will make sure that controls are operating effectively at the county every single year. If we notice that something you know, reverts back to a problem area, we would report that again. And then if I could follow up um, with Ms. Lesher. Uh, Ms. Lesher, with regard to uh, that finding, anything that the board needs to know in terms of direction to uh, the head of that department or, or anybody else in central administration? Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, no, we have implemented, as we, as you've heard, all of the requirements uh, in order to comply with the audit, both with our previous director, our interim director is here today to make sure that we're all hearing the same language, ensure that we're moving forward with full implementation of the recommendation. Hmm? All right. Um, and again, thank you for the presentation and for your patience. You're welcome. I just wanted to thank the board again for allowing us to present our audit results and status of the prior finding. And I would also like to take a moment to thank county management and their staff for their cooperation during the audit. We've had a great re working relationship with the county over the years and uh, we appreciate that and we look forward to working with them in the future. And I think we stole some people from you. You do have several people that used to work for our office. So, um, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that does not require action. It was a, um, uh, it was simply a presentation, but item 31 does require action, and that's uh, certification of compliance with Arizona revised statutes. I'll move the item. Second. Oh, okay. We do actually have to accept the audit results. Um, this is on item 27, so I'll move uh, acceptance. I'll second. Motion and a second. There's no discussion, no objections, motion carries. Moving on to item 31, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion, objections, hearing none, motion carries. We'll move quickly to consent calendar and then we're going to move to the uh, addendum, agendum, and item um, six after that, but let's consent calendar. What's pleasure of the board? Madam Chair. Supervisor Christie. I'd like to pull item, items on the consent calendar. Items number three, 10, 15, 25, and 27. Three, 10, 15, 25 and 27, is that correct? 3, 10, 15, 25, and 27. Okay, I'll move the remainder of consent. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to item three, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Supervisor Christie, you ask this item be pulled. I wish to pull this uh, to be able to vote against it. Okay, no, no discussion, just making that statement. That's correct. If there's no further discussion, um, are there any objections? I object. One objection from Supervisor Christie. Any further objections? Hearing none, motion carries four to one. Moving on to item 10, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Supervisor Christie. This item I wish to pull so I could vote against it. All right. If there are no further objections. Oh, oh, excuse me, I did have a question on this. Okay. Perhaps this could be 
directed to staff. This uh, is a state of early childhood development and health board, first things first, to provide for Pima early education program. Um, is this 13.6 million, which we're, we're receiving here, uh, is this in addition to Pima County's $30 million ARPA grant for this? Chair Bronson, Supervisor Christie, this is a portion of those funds, and this is what we this is our contract with the state to provide the scholarships that are through uh, the First Things First Early Education. Nicole Fife is here, and if if there's any additional information, Nicole, that you'd like to add, or is that does that sum it up? <laughs> okay. So we have there was an initial removal from the general fund. I believe it was for five million dollars for this program that's been paid back. And then we have contributed part of our ARPA funds, uh, and then the, the, the federal government is providing the rest. Chair Bronson, Supervisor Christie, the, uh, the, the 10 million that came in for the first year was from the Pima County allocation. I believe the other three, Nicole, if you can help with the granularity, are provided by some of our other partners on this, all of which go to pay for the scholarships that we buy from the state. So our allocation is still in this 13 million? Yes, sir. Uh, and out of that $13 million, what is our total allocation? Um, Madam Chair and Supervisor Christie, so $30 million in ARPA funding has been approved by the Board of Supervisors for the Pima Early Education Program. This $13 million is out of that $30 million. No general funds have been spent. Thank you. All right, I'll call the question. Any objections? I object. One objection. Madam, any Madam Chair. Supervisor. I, I just want to draw everybody's attention to some of the numbers uh, in this document. Um, and I want to remind everybody that the average cost for a family who wants to send their child to preschool in Pima County is $800 a month. Uh, if you'll, you notice uh, the amount of a scholarship for a school that is highly rated, in other words, they have a quality first star rating of anywhere from three to five, is anywhere from $7,296 up to $12,600. Quality first uh, schools that have a star rating of two can get $6,000 or up to $10,600. Uh, absent these scholarships, who would be expected to pay these costs? Well, the answer is obvious. It would be the parents. And these are parents who are grappling with the costs of health care, housing, gasoline, food. If they can't pay uh, this tuition, what's the alternative? Well, the answer is also very simple. Their kids don't go to preschool. They get left out. Uh, they do not get the benefits of quality early childhood education that the children of families with means do get. So we should look at this as more than just an investment uh, in these children and their families. We should look at it as an investment in our entire community. Uh, Supervisor Christie and I have both uh, voted many times uh, in the area where we hear that government can do the most in terms of encouraging economic expansion in our area and that is ensuring quality infrastructure. Uh, but we've also heard that with businesses that are looking to expand or locate in our community, they're looking at investment in talent and they're also looking at the quality of life that their uh, employees or prospective employees can expect. So I would say that the only area of the pre-K to higher education system where the county can play a significant role is preschool uh, because there are other governmental entities that take a leadership role in, in other parts of the uh, educational system. So we're certainly investing in talent uh, because the more education somebody has, the more likely they are to be uh, a, a quality employee. And we're certainly investing in quality of life. And then beyond that, uh, just the things that we've heard from educators with regard to the investment for these children in terms of what it means to their kindergarten readiness, their brain development, their development of social skills, uh, their work in literacy and numeracy, uh, this is, 
without uh, trying to sound hyperbolic, and I don't think I am, this might be the most ex important expenditure in our budget mm -hmm. uh, in this coming year uh, because we are investing in potential. Uh, and because that potential of our children is limitless, that makes the cost, uh, in my estimation, to be minuscule by comparison. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, any objections? I object. One objection, Supervisor Christie. No further objection. Motion carries four to one. Ma Madam Chair, can I also point out no, that no, this is for two fiscal years, not just one? Okay. Great. No, we already voted, so. Sorry. I okay. Okay. Um, item 15, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Supervisor Chris. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I merely wanted to pull this one to give uh, uh, a great deal of acknowledgement and thanks to the Southern Arizona Rescue Association for all of their hard work uh, of saving lives. Uh, it's harrowing duty, it's dangerous duty. They love it, they're passionate about it. They've been doing it since the uh, late 50s when there was the a horrific snowstorm up on Mount Wrightson that killed the Boy Scouts. And they have consistently been available and made themselves ready to help uh, stranded victims in similar situations, risking their lives, helping their community on very limited and little funds. And I just wanted to take a moment to thank them for their efforts and wish them Godspeed in, in their continued mission. Thank you, Manager. Um, I agree with you, and uh, they've done some amazing work. All right, if there are no objections, motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 25, I'll move that item. Second. Motion and a second. Supervisor Christie. Madam Chair, uh, I have a couple of questions on this. Uh, perhaps I could address the first one to the county administrator. Uh, in this item, this is the election services that are, pro that are providing the election printing services and materials for our our, our uh, upcoming election in the amount of $2.5 million. Um, my question, County Administrator Lesher, is why is the, the $2.5 million coming from the general fund and not the county recorder's budget? Is, is this the way it's always been done? or Chair Bronson, Supervisor Christie, yes, it is the way that there's the bifurcation of the recorder services and election services. The Pima County Elections Department actually runs those election services, and these have always been provided through the general fund. Or we haven't, the, the services that have been related to the election services are provided by the general, general fund, fund for the election department. And that's historical? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay. Um, my second question is perhaps better directed to a representative of the recorder's office. Perhaps someone from administration might be able to answer this. Uh, out of the two and a half million dollars that is being allocated from the general fund for the purposes of the printing materials for the election, um, what is the what is the uh, the type of ballots that are, are being printed? What what is the breakdown of, of all the ballots? Chair Bronson, Supervisor Christie, I, I can't answer for you without the recorder and hear others hear the exact breakdown of those ballots. I'm happy to get back to you with and all the members of the board with an answer. Well, hopefully the recorder will be here shortly and I can answer her that question as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right. Uh, if there's no further questions, any further discussion, any objections? Hearing no objections, motion carries unanimously. Moving on to item 27, Friends of Tucson Birthplace. I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Supervisor Christie. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is just merely a, a, a informational question. Um, this background on the Friends of Tucson Birthplace, it appears in all shape and form that it's a park. Why is this being treated separately uh, in this particular area? And why is it not oh. under the auspices and jurisdiction of NRPR? It's a if good it's question. a park. Chair Bronson, Supervisor Christie, it is county owned land, and I'm going to defer to Mr. DeBonis for an answer on that one. Thank you. 
Uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor Christie, uh, we have uh, several uh, facilities that are parks uh, that have historic uh, elements or cultural significance. Uh, those are typically administered uh, through our Office of Sustainability. In this particular case, uh, we have an agreement with the Friends of Tucson's Birthplace to go ahead and manage and, and operate that location on behalf of Pima County. So the Friends of Tucson birthplace are actually doing the care and maintenance of the site and the county is paying them for their efforts is that it madam chair supervisor Christie that's correct and is this every year uh, Madam Chair, Supervisor Christie, uh, the board uh, entered into a five-year agreement right. with the Friends uh, back in 2017. Uh, that uh, agreement had uh, two five-year renewal options, so this is the exercising of one of those five-year five renewal, renewal options. options. Okay. Thank you, Mr. DeBonis, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. If there's no further discussion, any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Again, we have people here from... Uh, community and workforce development. I'm going to move to item six, emergency on the addendum uh, agenda. Um, and um, I uh, put this item on. We and I think um, Supervisor Scott and our office have been getting consistent calls about lack, uh, well, challenges. We lost um, a provider who was doing most of the emergency rental assistance and then moved in-house. And I guess our uh, my concern, and I, I, I don't speak for Supervisor Scott, is that there seems to be, compared to our, uh, the one, the, in, the initial uh, agency we contracted with, we seem to be much slower in providing that rental assistance. And in some cases, and I, I can speak to, for my office, um, I asked our staff to, um, because we have received numerous calls about lack or the, how long it was taking to get that assistance, but we went on the website, and I think the website could use some updating. Our, my staff, who is quite adept at going through the our Pima County website, had a hard time locating um, where to call and who to call. And when they did call, it went in every instance to voicemail. So I don't want to point fingers. I just want to assure that we've got something in place, that we're doing something differently now, or will be, that we get responsiveness when constituents call, and that uh, we speed up the rental assistance uh, payments themselves. So, and Supervisor Scott, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, Madam Chair, I echo all of uh, your concerns and, and expectations uh, because we certainly have heard, and this has even been brought up in the weekly calls that Ms. Bazzotta from your office uh, facilitates, uh, Mr. Sullivan, that the transition from the Community Investment Corporation to the Community Action Agency has uh, had, some, uh, had some pitfalls and, and has taken longer uh, and so my, my biggest concerns, and, and they are aligned with, with the chairs, are that landlords and, and tenants in our community uh, deserve to know that they're going to be made whole as quickly as possible. And that's actually what we've been praised for. Uh, since this program began. With, with, since with CII. Co co correct, and, and to the point where we were even getting funds that had been originally designated by the federal government uh, for the state uh, because our program was getting money out so quickly. Uh, and so to hear that that uh, deserved record and reputation uh, is now being uh, called into question is my biggest concern but another one and you gave voice to it Madam Chair is responsiveness because I think any time a uh, constituent calls a county department uh, they need to get a response uh, quickly ideally within, within 24 hours and in the case of the uh, two constituents from our district that uh, Chair Bronson uh, referred to, uh, they certainly did not feel that was the case. So those would be my, my two biggest concerns. And thank you, Madam Chair. 
All right, and again, we don't need a response from you today, but if you could, in writing, outline what you're doing to change the process so that we speed it up. And again, I'm not, I don't want to play the blame game, sure. but I oh. do want it fixed, and it looks like it might not be working as effectively as it should be as efficiently. And as we, if we're headed, and it appears we are, into another recession, feds are going to raise interest rates the most vulnerable in our community. I, we already have an issue with people being homeless. We don't need to ensure that that gets worse. We need to make it better. Absolutely. Madam Chair. Supervisor Christie. And I, I would just like to make sure that in your, your analysis and your report that the Chair is referring to and requesting that there be some uh, analysis and data devoted to, to landlords and how the, the your department is uh, dealing with the landlords and what kind of, of procedure is involved to make sure that uh, as there are two parts to uh, mm -hmm. eviction and uh, uh, mandatory eviction problems that that we had also make sure that the landlords are addressed as well the property owners so if you could include that I'd appreciate that too absolutely All right. I think you're off the hot seat now. Okay. <laughs> Chair Brunson, um, respectfully, you know, I, this department, I haven't had any complaints. I have to say, we've had five constituents that had an immediate response back. So it's unfortunate that you've been brought here for I think it's probably a small minority of um, issues that have come up. Quite honestly, how many how many um, people have you served? Uh, Chair Bronson, uh, Supervisor uh, Grijalva, since the beginning of the of the pandemic, we've served uh, 12,500 households. Uh, this fiscal year alone, we have served uh, a little more than 7,000 households. And how many of that was CII? Uh, that is, uh, Chair Bronson, uh, uh, Supervisor Grijalva, that, that's completely Pima County. Uh, and one of our subrecipients, uh, uh, Compass Affordable Housing. And when, oh, oh you're talking the the general ever you're not right. just talking specifics got it all right thank well, you I, I mean I just think that if if we're going to ask departments to come forward sort of like being brought to the principal's office because you don't you know there's an issue then we have to let them respond in public if you're going to be asking them these kind of questions in public the memos later on not everyone has access to that and I want to make sure that the employees in these departments hear from from the board that we acknowledge the hard work that they're doing that we respect them as professionals and we value what they're doing for our community and so if the only opportunity we give staff is to just come up get kind of scolded and then send us a memo I don't think that's okay madam chair supervisor could I ask uh, Ms. Lesher um, uh, in, a, in a conversation that we had uh, Re regarding this issue, uh, you identified some systemic issues uh, that you wanted uh, uh, Mr. Sullivan and, and, and his team uh, to address. Uh, and I certainly agree with my colleague from District 5 that the record and reputation of the department in, in dealing uh, with these issues has is laudable and, and has received recognition around the state. But could you, uh, uh, perhaps in conjunction with Mr. Sullivan, talk about some of the systemic issues, perhaps as this transition from uh, the CIC to the CAA is being made that both of you have identified and, and uh, want to work on? Uh, thank you, Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, and, and we had asked staff to be here today thinking there would be an opportunity or that the questions would be directed for an opportunity to speak. So I apologize for having um, the director in this position at this point. But what, what we began to talk about, and Dan and I talked about along with uh, Dr. Garcia, to whom Mr. Sullivan reports, is after the initial meetings to look at what I consider the bifurcation of the issues, that we have a specific issue that dealt with a constituent. We needed to walk through um, the issues that r r were arose while we spoke with that individual. It then came up when we looked through the, um, the communication that came from the constituent and the, con the issues that Dan and I talked about more were some concerns that came up about lack of responsiveness uh, and that throughout the communication there were comments about had calls been returned in a timely fashion and things like that those were the issues that Dan and I began to talk about about do we need additional staff are the numbers increasing what has occurred while we went through the transition of using another agency then it came back to us if the numbers are going up 
what do we need to do from the county side to make sure that the department has adequate resources to respond to what might be increased calls, et cetera. And we began to look at um, not only what might be the problems that are coming up, but what it is that we need to do as a county to make sure that, that we can respond to those concerns. And that's what I was trying to get at. And I do think one of these things means looking at the web page and making this the rental assistance more easily accessible because it's it is buried down in there. Thank you. Madam Chair. Supervisor. Could I ask either uh, Mr. Sullivan or, or uh, Ms. Lesher, um, whichever you prefer, in, in terms of your own internal analysis, uh, what have you found to be some of the systemic challenges that we're dealing with uh, as we're making the transition from the Community Investment Corporation to the Community Action Agency? Mr. Sullivan, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, you know, I, I would say that uh, uh, since the beginning of this program, you know, that this is difficult money to uh, administer. You know, uh, changes from Treasury have happened often. Uh, you know, I, I've been really proud of my staff uh, throughout the course of, of the, the program because they've, they've rolled with it. You know, they, they've shown their grit. Um, since the, the city of Tucson and its main sub-recipient um, CIC have decided not to continue on with the program, um, they found that they had 3,500 cases that they just couldn't uh, um, get to you know they, they had been doing mostly city of Tucson completely city of Tucson and we've been doing outside of the the city limits uh, we thought it was the right thing to do to uh, transition those, those cases over to us uh, so right now you know we're we working through that uh, <clears throat> some of the cases that, that we've seen that were transferred over to us from CIC uh, date back to January so so we're getting to those folks as soon as possible uh, of, of that 3,500 that, that came from the city's backlog uh, we've already assigned uh, 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 1,600, a little more than 1,600 to our case managers. So we are we're getting to the folks who have been there the longest. Uh, as we are also uh, continuing to get new people uh, uh, applying for assistance, and in order to ensure that that we're responsive to folks, we've recently set up a call center so that folks can call and, and talk to somebody or have that have their. How their, recently? Uh, in, in the last actually two weeks, <laughs> it's been it's been okay. set up, and and also through the Office of Emergency Eviction Legal Services, we've set up uh, a. Um, escalation team, uh, you know, sort of uh, ninjas, if you will, of, of folks who are are there for people who are about to become evicted or in instances where, you know, we may see red flags, uh, and those folks have performed uh, really valiantly so far. So um, really it is, I think that once that we're done with the city's backlog of, of folks that would have gone... Why are we uh, doing the city? Why isn't the city doing the city? Because, uh, Chair Bronson, the, the city has decided, well, they're, they're running out of money uh, and they have decided not to request uh, reallocated from uh, reallocated funds from uh, DES we're currently in negotiations to ask for another 30 million dollars for our community for rent and utility assistance uh, as well as two million dollars from Department of Treasury to ensure that, that we have adequate resources in our community for as long as possible uh, throughout the country though you're seeing uh, uh, jurisdictions close these programs down once they've run out of funds because you know it's it's uh, been difficult you know we 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 think it's important that, that when there's money available that we uh, apply for it, try, try to get it that, so that we can get it out to tenants and, and to landlords as, as quickly as possible. Yep. Madam Chair. Supervisor. So the, the city uh, is no longer uh, receiving any federal funds and that's why they decided to pull out of the partnership uh, that they had had with us and the CIC? Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, yes, and, and they've decided not to apply for any additional. And so the city of Tucson it refuses to apply for any additional funds. Is that what you're saying? Chair Bronson, uh, yes, yeah, they, they've decided not to um, uh, ask uh, uh, DES for reallocated funds. You know that that's not something that that is definite at this point. We've had very very uh, encouraging conversations with DES uh, and and have made the request for thirty million dollars. Well, I, I think funds. what what our what Pima County is doing is the right thing to. Do. I'm a little appalled that the city is not a partner, that's all. Um, and Mr. Sullivan, uh, the funds that we're requesting uh, from D DES, are those still funds that were originally uh, intended for, uh, for the state uh, to distribute? Uh, 
Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, yes. Uh, yes. And it's in the form of the Emergency Rental Sorry, Assistance second Program uh, second round allocation. Okay. So, so uh, I believe it's still completely unspent. It's around $200 million that they have. Uh, so what DES is doing is going around to different municipalities uh, to see you know, who, who wants them and, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll have a decision and the ability to have some certainty soon. So part of this uh, transition uh, from the CIC to CAA is the fact uh, that Pima County uh, and, and, and CAA uh, are, are now solely responsible uh, for the uh, distribution of um, uh, rental relief funds to landlords and tenants in Pima County, including uh, uh, within the city of Tucson. Chair Bronson, Supervisor Scott, that's correct. And um, moving forward, we are going to be contracting with community-based agencies. You know, for example, Compass Affordable Housing, uh, fa uh, Family Housing Resources, uh, uh, the Amphi Foundation, who have been subrecipients to CIC, who have done the majority of, of the the processing of, of applications. So, as CIC shuts down, because they still have a little bit of money uh, uh, left to spend, so as soon as as they're done, uh, they're going to uh, hopefully transition in, and to be subrecipient uh, contractors to us. Yeah, Mr. Sullivan, would you, in your report, get us some numbers based on the information you just gave us? And would also like to see um, some specificity on the backlogs and you know how backlog, meaning sure. the timelines. Absolutely, and, and uh, Chair Bronson, members of the board, uh, a, a piece of information that that. Uh, we looked at recently is, is the standard that we're setting for our, our case managers. So when somebody applies to when they uh, a case manager takes their their case to, to when it closes, uh, we're averaging anywhere from one day. You know, if we have a landlord that, and a tenant, that's what it used to be. Yeah, absolutely, right. one day all the way to three weeks. But we're averaging yeah. around two weeks or so. Uh, but but it is you know the, the folks that that were on CIC's wait list since January that are sort of skewing our numbers. And then numbers just right talking now. about a little bit about personnel, you're talking caseworkers I mean we can't we've got so many openings at this point that we can't fill so you may not have the numbers right now but if you include that in report how many caseworkers Indeed. given your load should we have uh, chair Bronson absolutely Absolutely. Oh, and Chair Bronson, you know, we, we, we're working with CIC and, and all the other agencies, anybody who has been displaced by the city closing down to, to bring on that talent to, to, keep, uh, to keep those good folks working uh, and continuing to, to produce cases. And then you said you're go going to be, I don't know, this is not the best terminology here, praising, but farming some of it out to other social service agencies. If you could include a list of those that you are... Um, at this point having those conversations with? Chair Bronson, absolutely. That'd be great. We'd like to see that. Anything else? Madam Chair, if, if we could request uh, Ms. Lesher, uh, especially during um, uh, this time of, of transition, and I think uh, Mr. Sullivan has given a voice to some of the challenges that uh, the department is dealing with as this transition is undergoing, uh, if the board could get uh, written communication uh, from uh, your office as to how that uh, transition is proceeding, especially with regard to the systemic issues uh, that you and um, Dr. Garcia and Mr. Sullivan have identified. That would be, that would be helpful. And I did want to say also that uh, what I hear from my staff is that the uh, um, constituents who came to us with concerns and, and who, uh, whose situation helped bring to light some of these transitional issues that we're dealing with uh, feel really good about where things stand as of right now. I just heard that from a staff member this morning. Yeah, well, that, I think that happened last week or... Last night. Last, yeah. Right. Well, Friday, actually. Excuse me. Right. Okay. I thought I was going to say I appreciate that last week. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, Chair Bronson, I just want to say I want to thank your staff for really helping support families through really difficult times. Um, one of the families that we um, were able to refer over who didn't know where to go, literally just not even looking stuff up, just like, where do I go? I need help. Um, you made a huge difference in, in that family's life. And... It, it was, it's significant. So I want to thank you all. That's just one story that I know sure. a lot of details about, but 
makes a big difference. Chair Bronson, uh, Supervisor Grijalva, thank you so much. You know, I can't be prouder uh, uh, of the staff. Yeah, uh, we have Rena Delic uh, in the back over there who really, uh, the whole team since March uh, have, have worked themselves, uh, you know, nights, weekends, you know, we're, we're trying to ensure that they have a work-life balance. You know, I think Irina has taken one vacation <laughs> since March tw uh, 2020. So, you know, their heart is in it and, and they continue to do wonderful work. Well, thank you all for being here. I know it's a really busy time. I appreciate Absolutely. your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's move on then to the regular agenda. Item 24, County Administrator's Update. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Thank you very much. Chair Bronson, let me start. I know that you had asked some questions about the Contreras fire, and I will begin with that. As of this morning, it is now, the fire is at about 24,761 acres. Ouch. We are, for, uh, as of this morning, 50% contained, which is some of the good news. Um, we still have the Pentoc Village under evacuation. Some of the individuals who are on the nation who have uh, had some mobility concerns were, early, were evacuated early on. There has been damages uh, to four, uh, locate four facilities at this point, either damage or uh, destruction of a dorm, two outbuildings, and a vacant house that's up at the Kitt Peak area. Uh, the telescopes remain safe at this point. The road 386 uh, that leads up to Kitt Peak is closed. Um, we've got, I think I was looking at the last number, um, uh, this is obviously, it's, it's BIA land. It is under the direction of Incident Command with, the, with BIA. Uh, our team from Emergency Management has been fully engaged from day one and uh, other additional county departments involved with NRPR who's providing staging opportunities at parks and also uh, uh, looking at providing water supply from those supports and uh, the Department of Transportation that has, I believe at this point, four, perhaps five tenders that are being used on site as well. Uh, our emergency management team stays in contact throughout the day, participates in all regular updates and communication, and we have been pushing those to you, Supervisor uh, Bronson, as it is your district, but happy to share with others as well. Okay, and I understand we've got issues there on stage five alert, I think it is, Hayhook Ranch and Cowtown Kilako. We are, we are using, some, uh, Chair Bronson, we're using some of those facilities, private lands, as well as lands that are counties that are leased and Elkhorn, to And Elkhorn, I guess, and yeah. Elkhorn for staging facilities. And uh, as, as happens with fires, some of our staging facilities move <laughs> as, as the fire moves and, and different parts of the property have been, um, uh, have had areas of concern. But we, as I say, we continue to watch. And the fact that we're now at 50% containment is great news, as with some rain over the last weekend, that we will keep you updated. Um, I do have a couple other comments. I just wanted to give a few shout outs to folks and since we were just mentioning the tenders from DOT, I'll go first to the Department of Transportation and who is uh, one of our departments at the lead as we prepare moving into monsoon season. And uh, thanks very much to them. There's a whole bunch of information about monsoon safety and preparation and information. And I'd encourage people to go to Pima.gov, be flood safe, where there is a, a lot of reminders of how we can all stay safe during the monsoons. Uh, our historic courthouse renovation was recognized Yay. as the Public Works Project right. of the Year yeah. for 2022 That's by amazing. the American Public Works Association, which is a uh, uh, significant event and will be acknowledged, I believe, at a public event this August. So. Great, great news to that. Uh, National Association of Clean Water Agencies recognized two of Pima County wastewater treatment facilities for perf uh, exceptional performance. So thanks to Jackson and the entire team. Uh, Health Department received two innova innovative practice awards from the National Association of City County Health Officials. Some of those include the dashboards and other things that have been occurring, so shout out to them. Uh, Pima Animal Care received a $90,000 grant from Petco, Petco Love, that is the nonprofit profit arm of Petco, many of us shop there, uh, and it's helping fund some of our community adoption programs. So congratulations to them and for that great work. Uh, Public Works Department just kicked off the Public Works Christmas in July food drive. Uh, as you know, many of the Public Works Departments do have food boxes up uh, through July 8th, uh, and if you would like one for your area, please feel free to contact the Public Works Department and they'll help you out. And finally, the Vaccine Solutions Dashboard received a silver award for innovative practice uh, nationally. So as you can see, we've got people not only doing incredible work helping out with our local fires and with the monsoons, uh, but I think I've just gone through very quickly five or six or more national awards and recognition uh, for your county department. So thank you for having allowing me to have an opportunity to at least sing their praises for a moment. 
Thank you. All right, thank you. And now I want to move on to item 25. I, and uh, County Administrator Lesher, you're recommending approval of the, in the uh, recommended budget um, of cost of living adjustment of $690,000, is that correct? Uh, Chair Bronson, if I may, first of all, I, I, I hesitate to use the words cost of living adjustments and would like to simply refer to these more as salary adjustments at this salary. point. Salary? But okay. um, the, what we the, have done based the, uh, on the recommendations that members of the board have brought forward, uh, we would support the recommendation of, in the document we sent to you on June 20, the June 21st memo, which we're calling uh, District 5C, D5C, uh, which is 8.5% for those earning 30 35,000 or less, 5% for those earning between 35,001 and 75,000, 3% for those earning over 75,000 to 150, and then 1% uh, above for all eligible employees. And again, that is a total impact uh, over the proposed budget, uh, the, the tentatively adopted budget of about $690,000 out of the general fund. Do we need to approve that today, or are you going to put that in a memo for a final adoption? Chair Bronson, I would ask today for adoption, for a recommendation from I'll the board. I'll move that item then. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Any objection? I object. One objection, Supervisor Christie. Um, and Supervisor Hines. Super, you're objecting? Okay. Two objections. Motion carries three to two. Moving on to item 26, final plat with assurances. I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Any objections? Hearing none. Motion carries. Um, items 28, 29, 30. We already did 31. 32. Under real property, 33, 34. Um, does anybody wish to divide that question? Madam Chair. Supervisor. I'd like to pull item 30 and 36. Okay, I did not. You didn't go up that far? No, I didn't go that far. How, what, what was your limit? Um, we went to, <laughs> what's my limit? Uh, <laughs> let me Don't give that it. some thought. No. <laughs> Don't give her soft. Maybe I should uh -huh, uh -huh. use the better 30, phrase. Uh, <laughs> uh, 30, I went to 34. <laughs> and 31, we already had taken care of. So I, I would only pull out of that limit. I would only pull out a third, pull out number I, 30. I, I, out of item 30? Yes. Okay, okay, I'll move 28, 29, 32, 33, 34. I'll second. Motion and a second. Any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to item 30, I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Um, you pulled the item? I did, and the reason I pulled it is so I could vote no. Okay, got it. No, no questions, just your, okay. Correct. If there, I'll call the question if there, are there objections? I object. One objection, Supervisor Christie. No further objection, motion carries. Moving on to item 35 and resolution 2022-36. I'll move the item. A second. Motion and a second, any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to 35B, grant acceptance. I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Uh, any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to item 36, Amtrak passenger rail route and service and resolution 2022-37. I'll move the item. Second. Motion and a second. Supervisor Christie. I object. One objection. Is there any further objections? Madam Chair. Supervisor. Just wanted to uh, point out as um, uh, the county's representative to the Pima Association of Governments and the Regional Transportation Authority Board uh, that PAG as the Metropolitan, Organi Metropolitan Planning Organization for the area unanimously uh, passed a resolution at our last meeting uh, endorsing uh, the same language that you see uh, in, in this uh, resolution. 
Uh, there was also a letter that was uh, drafted and, and written uh, earlier this year that was signed by the mayors of Phoenix, Tucson, Marana, Oro Valley, uh, and other jurisdictions uh, that echo the language of this resolution. Um, I would also like to uh, request uh, that Ms. Manriquez uh, send a copy of this resolution to her counterparts in Maricopa and Pinal County uh, because one of the things that we heard from the Amtrak representative at the PAG meeting is that there is power in numbers. I don't know if our counterparts in Maricopa and Pinal have considered similar resolutions, but I certainly want to encourage them uh, to do so because what we heard from the Amtrak representative is the more they hear from our region that there's interest uh, in uh, passenger rail uh, service between Tucson and Phoenix, the more likely that we're going to qualify for some of the money in that, um, uh, in, in that allocation. All right, thank you for that information. Um, Again, I think we, there was one objection and that was from Supervisor Christie. All right, moving on to hearings. Items 37, franchises, license permits, 37 through 42 on the regular agenda and item 11 on the addendum agenda. And um, these are hearings. Is there anyone in the audience or on the line who wishes to object to any of these? If not, I'm going to move that we close the hearing and approve these items. Items 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, and item 11 on the addendum. And with the note that uh, with the fireworks permits, check in with your local fire provider and to make sure you're doing it safe given the season and the dry tinder we've got out there. And if there are no objections, was there a second? I'll, I'll second. second. Motion and a second. If there are no objections, motion carries. That brings us, that completes the regular agenda. And now we are moving to the addendum. And I move to item five, release of county attorney, cl attorney client privilege information regarding legal counsel for the mayor commission. I'll move for the release. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on. I'm going to take items seven out of, I'm going to move to item eight, nine, and 10. If there are no objections, I'll move those items. Second. second. Motion and a second. Any objections? Hearing none, motion carries. Moving on to item seven, Supervisor Christie. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to just say that uh, I want to uh, make a statement that I agree with Super Supervisor Grahava's earlier uh, words about how she objected to uh, having department heads come before the board basically being sent home after school and then remanded to do some homework and not have a, uh, a dialogue and I'm very disappointed that the county re recorder uh, chose not to attend here because that was my intention to have a free-flowing dialogue and allow the county recorder the opportunity to address uh, new, a number of situations that occurred in her office that uh, are impacting uh, not only uh, my constituents but the county as well and would hopefully shed some light on some of the issues that happen that uh, at least what I'm getting from my constituents is a uh, uh, situation of, of, of concern and awareness um, and I'm sure that uh, my colleagues are getting similar uh, inquiries too about um, the fact that uh, 40,000 ID cards were sent out that were filled with wrong information and since she's no longer she's not here to address these um, I'll just basically recite some of the questions I was going to ask her um, I apparently her indication that she was not going to attend today was evidenced by a letter that she wrote to, and I must, I'm using her words, acting county administrator Jan Lesher yesterday. <laughs> um, so I would assume that this was her notice that she wouldn't be attending. 
I believe that's true, sir, yes. So and you're not acting, or, well, you do act out. <laughs> so this I, apparently was, there's no mention that she wouldn't be attending uh, by this memorandum, but I assume that that was the purpose of the memorandum. Um, first of all, the first question I was going to ask her is, is an obvious one. How did this happen and why? And that there was a very in-depth article uh, in the uh, Green Valley News that uh, went into great detail about uh, what, what stipulated with um, the 625,000 voter ID cards that went to voters uh, and many had outdated information and would need to be reprinted and resent and uh, this was said to be a knowing decision by the county recorder. Uh, she also mentions that in the, in the article that this went out in May. I'd like to know when in May those uh, items were mailed out. The memo says May 3rd. The I didn't get mine till. Yeah, it's in the. But I didn't get mine till almost ten days later, in the mail. Um, okay. It, oh, so I May third was May third was the date that the board of supervisors approved the redistricting. Correct. Yeah. Sorry. So that wasn't the date that no. the, the right. they were sent out. So that's what I'd like to know is when they were sent out, particularly when we this board approved the redistricting on May third. Um, the article states that the original mailing of 625,000 cards cost, the mailing cost, $110,000. Now you do the math, that comes to 18 cents a mailing, a card. Then the article says that the 84,000 cards will be resent and the cost to mail these will be $20,534. The question I wanted to ask to the county recorder is, that's the mailing alone. Uh, what are the printing and production costs per card? And what is the printing and, and production cost for the 84,000 that will have to be reprodu reprinted and reproduced? Uh, she's just putting the mailing costs out, but 84,000 ID cards reproduced and represented repr uh, reproduced and reprinted uh, I'm sure would be very costly if you've looked at those cards they're quite intricate intricate and uh, intense and I would say just a conservative estimate and I don't know and that's why I wish she was here to answer that let's just say two dollars per card so if you do the math again uh, 168,000 to reprint plus the twenty thousand five hundred and thirty four dollars to remail comes to $188,534. I, I would just like to have her input on that particular item. Um, she talks about there was a because of the redistricting of this board and its efforts to, to uh, uh, redistrict our, our supervisorial districts that this caused her to have to it, have to speed up the mailing of these cards. That doesn't make any sense. So I don't quite understand uh, when, when in a memo by the county administrator uh, states, and this memo is uh, as of December seventh, twenty twenty one. The ad county administrator says the work of the redistricting advisory committee will be completed by April 30th to be finalized by the Board of Supervisors by May 30th, well in advance of the July 1 required deadline. Yep. In fact, it was completed on May 3rd. So where was the delay and why, what, what all we basically did was just extend the amount of time that we had to do our redistricting by a couple of weeks. This should not have impacted or had any effect on the mailing and um, she also says um, in her uh, in the article that sh that uh, the, the voter cards that were voted that were met, uh, mailed in May were sent out knowing many had outdated information and would need to be reprinted and resent Jeez. yet that in her 
memorandum to uh, Ms. Lesher of yesterday afternoon, she states, at the time of the mailing, all information was accurate to the best of our knowledge. Well, e either it's accurate or it's not. And she kind of uh, makes two different statements about this. Um, other questions I had for her in this article, she states um, that printing storage, is printing storage issues and nationwide paper shortages also contributed to the do-over, which she called unavoidable. I, I don't quite understand how that took place uh, and what that, that has to do with mailing out information that's, that's not correct. And then she goes on to state, in order for us to maintain the operations of our office, it was contingent on us mailing out those mailings when we did. Why? I don't understand that. Uh, and that's why I wish she was here, she could address that. Um, furthermore, she kept talking about a deadline to send out the uh, voter ID cards. There is no statutory deadline for sending out voter ID cards, even though we adopted the new redistricting on May 3rd, well in advance of the actual deadline that was uh, set by the legislature. And uh, finally, um, the Elections Integrity Commission, which she appeared before, voted unanimously um, on, an ish on an item uh, that I think is, is very important, and I, I wish she was here to address that too. That, the, that there was a concern raised uh, that there would be no poll adver uh, observers at the early voting locations, that she was not going to allow poll observers at the early voting locations, and that the EIC voted against such action, and apparently that, that uh, referral is coming before the, the uh, board for uh, dissemination, but um, I, I'm sorry she wasn't here. I think these are legitimate questions. I think the answers need to be given to the community. And there are more expenses than, than she's, uh, I believe, than, than she's uh, conveying here. And I think those need to be accounted for. She said something about the effect that the, the extra costs for having to reprint and remail the uh, ID cards with the wrong information was going to come out of her contingency fund. You know, that, that's, that's not how it should work. It should come out of her general fund budget, out of her own budget. A contingency bu uh, account does not cover up mistakes. That's not the intent of a contingency account. So I'm concerned about that, and I'm also concerned that sh as things go along, is she going to come back before the board to cover some other mistakes? So I wish she had been here. I think it speaks volumes that she's not. And uh, I'm disappointed that, that she's not here. And I can't ask her any questions, so I'm, I'm done with mine. Thank Chair you. Bronson. Excuse me, Chair Bronson. Um, so the recorder did let the clerk's office know she was unable to attend today due to an active election. They're in an election. Um, and that's why she provided a memorandum to the board that was distributed yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Thank you. And Chair Bronson. So, yep. Just uh, real quickly, um, with regard to these, you know, the... Um, cards that were mailed with some uh, inaccurate information. I think just important to point out that over 90% of voters, it's anticipated going forward, will be voting uh, by, by mail. mail. Um, and then for the 10% uh, who will be voting in person, because we would now have a vote center system, if, for example, something was erroneous and caused them to potentially have the wrong precinct listed or something, it won't matter because at whatever vote center, early vote site that they go to, they will be able to have a ballot printed on demand. So literally not a single voter will be having any trouble uh, casting a ballot as a result of some of these um, errors in this mailing. It, is an ex it, it certainly sounds like there was a waste of funds there, which I agree with you is, is lamentable, but this will not in any way impact uh, any voter's ability to mm -hmm. cast a ballot. At the day, day of election, but if the voters who vote by mail don't look at the new cards coming out, that, that's potentially a problem. I, I don't see how it would be. Well, it they it, it may present a problem to them, some confusion. Um, 
again, uh, it's un very unfortunate and very was very unnecessary. But um, having said that, I want to just before we adjourn, um, want to ask Miss Lesher to ask Mr. Sullivan. Why, one of the things I forgot to say uh, and mention was that it appears at least probably seven or eight calls we've gotten that they are closing out cases in 24 hours if the applicant doesn't respond and again these are you know these are renters who may not have access to the internet um, may not have cell phones or uh, so if we can get Mr. Sullivan and his crew to address that. I don't know if that information, I mean, those are the concerns we're hearing. As to their accuracy, I can't obviously um, reflect. But, um, and with that, are there any more comments before we adjourn? Just want to remind everybody today is solstice, the longest day of the year, and the shortest board meeting we've had in a while. And with that, if there are no objections, this meeting stands adjourned.